the five Viking seasons you would most like to see on a Netflix documentary next on Minnesota Sports Rankum. This is Minnesota Sports Rankum, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota, and it starts now. Welcome into Minnesota Sports Rankum. I'm Sam Ekstrom. If you're snowed in like me, great chance to indulge in another episode that settles debates and starts new ones. Today's topic on Minnesota Sports Rankum, the five Viking seasons you would most like to see on a Netflix documentary. I've been watching a lot of Netflix lately. Just watched Full Swing, the PGA Tour documentary. I binged that thing the first week it came out. And word is, there's another bingeable Netflix series coming out, Kirk Cousins. Patrick Mahomes and Marcus Mariota were documented during the 2022 season. And this summer we'll get to watch that back. That's going to be fantastic. And what a year to document for Kirk Cousins. We'll get behind the curtain with him. And it got me thinking a little more broadly, which Viking seasons would go the most viral, which Viking season had the most behind the scenes drama, the characters that were larger than life. We're going to dig into that on today's Minnesota sports rank them. That is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. All right, before I start giving you the top five, how about some honorable mentions? 1987, they had replacement players to start the season. The Vikings had a journeyman QB, Wade Wilson, who led them to an NFC championship game. It was a miracle Vikings run. And along the way, they had an unbelievable heater from Anthony Carter, who got them there and set the all-time Vikings single game yardage record in the divisional round against San Francisco. I think that season would have presented a lot of fun. And then, of course, a devastating end at Washington. The drop by Darren Nelson. Uh, 2005, Love Boat. I think the 2005, just on that alone, elevates itself to the very brink. But other than that, I guess there wasn't a ton of talent on that team. It wasn't a very interesting football team. They did go through the Dante uh, knee shattering that kind of ended his career unofficially. New ownership. Definitely some interesting elements to that season. I think it's just on the outside because that football team wasn't very interesting. Didn't have a lot of big characters on that team. Uh, 2003, middle of the Tice era, start out 6-0, and and then collapse and miss the playoffs on the last play of the season at Arizona. I think that that dive into um, collapse would have been pretty fascinating. Uh, 2017, I think 2017, a lot of people might argue that should be in the mix. I think it's just on the outside looking in. You've got the Minneapolis Miracle, obviously, followed by the fiasco in Philly. but battling through uh, quarterback injuries, Sam Bradford going down, Dalvin Cook going down. And then that would have been a very feel-good, I think, documentary until the end, of course. But it would have been a very uplifting, positive, uh, playing for each other, camaraderie in the locker room kind of season. That would have you know, brought a smile to your face, perhaps. Maybe some goosebumps with the Diggs miracle. And then uh, last honorable mention, then we'll get into the list, 2016. I think similar to 2003, Quick start, 5-0, and collapse, miss the playoffs. The collapses are always more fun to document. Let's be real about that. Uh, Zimmer had the slaughtered stuffed animal saga. If you don't remember that, go Google that. Fat cats get slaughtered. Mike Zimmer, he was at the center of a lot of this. Mike Zimmer uh, made comments about how they weren't ready for the big time. I think people started turning on Zimmer slightly that season. They uh, they had the Zimmer eye issue, which is very unfortunate. He had emergency eye surgery. Whole team got decimated by injuries. And then underlying underneath it all, the Adrian Peterson a return from injury saga. He announced his return on like a satellite radio show. It was kind of weird. But that team uh, let down expectations majorly. And it was the first year of U.S. Bank Stadium as well. So I just listed off a ton of craziness. And I still have five that I think would be more interesting to document. So number five on this list, the five most bingeable Minnesota Vikings seasons, if they had a Netflix documentary, number five, 
Let's go recent. The 2022 Minnesota Vikings. Recency bias comes into play for sure, but come on. It was one of the most historically bizarre and wonderful regular seasons in NFL history. A team that won every single one possession game. A team that won games with last second comebacks week after week. 61 yard field goals. A fumbled snap in the end zone. The Justin Jefferson catch. The biggest comeback in NFL history. And I'm still leaving off some games that in a lot of seasons would be a team's most exciting game of the year. The Vikings were walking on a tightrope every single week, and they were doing it with a new coaching staff, a new coaching staff trying to make its mark, which obviously lends some intrigue to that documentary. Kirko Chains, a much beleaguered quarterback that a lot of people didn't even want on the team, finds himself. He comes into his own. He gets comfortable in his own skin for the first time in Minnesota, and he's wearing chains on an airplane. Can we get the camera on the plane for the Kirko Chains moment? We only saw like 10 second clips from Instagram from that uh, plane flight. What else happened on the plane? And what was going on behind the scenes as Kevin O'Connell tried to right the ship on defense? The defense really what let this team down. What were the conversations like with Ed Donatel? How was he handling himself during this time? I want to see all of that. And of course, I want to see the veterans on that defense responding to it. Eric Kendricks, Daniil Hunter, um, Harrison Smith, Patrick Peterson, very proud defensive players. How were they dealing with uh, the, the, the meltdowns defensively over and over again, getting uplifted by the offense with those uh, amazing comebacks? But 2022, up until the playoffs, it would have been a great show. It just would have fallen very flat with that final game. And then I'm sure like you can already picture sort of the B roll playing over the documentary with the pumped in like radio host saying the Minnesota Vikings are frauds. The DVOA is so low that the Vikings can't possibly sustain this winning clip. And you can see the players responding to the haters and saying, no, we're different. And unfortunately it didn't turn out that way in the postseason. So that's your number five, most bingeable, Viking season if it were a Netflix documentary four to go but first we're coming out of the NBA all-star break the time is now to download FanDuel America's number one sports book new customers get a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win download the FanDuel sportsbook app which is safe secure and super easy to use. Bet on everything from money line to point scores to three points drained. You can lump all of the stats and all the bets together in the same game parlay to maximize your winnings. And remember, no sweat first bet if you're a new sign up. So go to fanduel.com slash locked on, fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. Make every moment more with Fanduel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, number four on the list. 2018. If 2022 is mostly a feel good documentary, this is the exact opposite. This is what happens when everything goes wrong. And we've got another one of these type of seasons on the list that exceeds 2018. But this was a clunker, folks. This was a season that had sky high expectations. And the most captivating reality TV is when things unravel. And 2018 unraveled. And it, it honestly started in tragedy. Remember 2018, and I'm not making light of this at all. Tony Sperano passes away before the season and sent that season really into a tailspin emotionally. And Mike Zimmer even went back in his final press conference and said, we never recovered from Tony Sperano's death. Uh, a sudden tragic loss. The offensive line coach, who was really a backbone of the coaching staff and that offensive line unit, he passed away before the season due to a heart attack. So it starts out on a very sobering note. Meanwhile, you've got Kirk Cousins coming in, galloping in, in free agency, the big quarterback who, think about this. This is five years ago. He signed for a record deal. Three years, $84 million. That was a record deal at the time. Think of how the quarterback market has shifted just in five years. Now it's like $15, or $15 million more per year. If you wanted to like set the quarterback money record, that's how 
the league and the salary cap are just shifting and, and expanding so rapidly. But Kirk Cousins comes in a record-breaking deal. The expectations are sky high. And I think if you go behind the scenes that season, you're going to see a lot of Kirk Cousins you know, f- feeling things out. He's not comfortable in his own, his own skin yet. It would be a fascinating contrast to the 2022 doc where Kirk Cousins is five years in and has opinions and has buddies on the team and has inside jokes. None of that in 2018. We've heard Kirk say that he was he didn't want to really speak up with his own opinion. He wanted to just be the CEO quarterback who showed up to work, did his job, and then went home at the end of the day. And there, there were issues that season. Kirk Cousins gave the ball away a lot. Fumbles, major issue. Pick sixes, major issue. Not coming through in the final drive of a game a major issue. Think about some of the games along the way that season. Week two, the Daniel Carlson collapse in Green Bay. Three missed field goals. Crazy game. Not Kirk Cousins' fault. Um, A tie in Green Bay because the kicker melted down and Mike Zimmer cut him the next day. (laughs) Crazy. Uh, The next week after that, Buffalo loss against Josh Allen, who really had his coming out party there. And the Vikings get steamrolled by a horrible Bills team. One of the the greatest upsets in terms of the spread in NFL history. And the Bills crushed the Vikings at U.S. Bank Stadium. You've also got the John DeFilippo subplot. The offensive coordinator who was brought in with Kirk Cousins. They were supposed to be this unbeatable pair that both came into the team. John DeFilippo ridiculed by Mike Zimmer in the media and privately. Like we only saw it in the media where John DeFilippo was ripped. Think about the conversations behind the scenes. Think about Mike Zimmer in the meeting room after a game telling John DeFilippo to establish the run, John, and then firing him after an abysmal showing in Seattle late that season. Remember it was back-to-back weeks against New England and against Seattle, where the Vikings had no offense whatsoever. And uh, and John Filippo was fired with three games to go in the season. And then after all of that, for 15 games, the Vikings still have a chance to make the playoffs. Kevin Stefanski's calling plays. The Bears come in as division champions with nothing to play for, really. And the Vikings lose in Week 17 against Chicago. And there was the viral... Kirk Cousins, Stefan Diggs, Adam Thielen, sideline little uh, water cooler talk where Kirk Cousins is trying to gesture and show Adam Thielen how he wants him to run the route that probably didn't need to go as viral as it did. That's just in the heat of the moment conversation, but it absolutely became memeable and Cousins got crushed for it. And, uh, And that season ended flat. And the Vikings didn't do anything they set out to do. They didn't even make the playoffs. That season would have been fascinating to see unravel behind the scenes. All right, two down, three to go on our list of the five most Netflix-worthy Vikings seasons. Number three, 2009. Oh, yeah, 2009. Brett Favre coming to town. That's all I would need to say. I mean, that alone... That's the documentary right there. The Vikings quarterbacks are Tavares Jackson and Sage Rosenfels going into that season. You think the 2009 team has nearly the notoriety without Brett Favre and the way he came in in August after it looked like, looked like he was retired. It looked like he was done. They bring him in on a plane. You've got Brad Childress kind of dour about the whole thing. Brett Favre calling him chilly in the first press conference, and and it was off to the races from there. Brett Favre has a career year, 2009. Greg Lewis catch, week three. Probably the greatest catch in Vikings history before Justin Jefferson in Buffalo. Um, Just in terms of the actual catch combined with the moment, Greg Lewis, two seconds left, back of the end zone. Brett Favre's first signature moment in Minnesota, an incredible game against the Niners. Brett Favre's first game against Green Bay on Monday night, followed by his return to Green Bay about five weeks later, which the Vikings also won. Vikings go 12-4 and that year. Brett Favre, Sidney Rice, Bernard Berrien. 
those were not exactly generationally great Vikings receivers, but because they were playing with Favre, I mean, Vasante Shenko, they kind of are household names now because of the plays they made during that season. Adrian Peterson as the running back, he had a great year. And th this, again, mostly an uplifting season of TV. However, you had some bumps along the way. Remember, Brett Favre and Brad Childress did not necessarily get along. And Brad Childress wanted to bench him in Carolina on that Sunday night game. They had some blowups. Um, and behind the scenes, you know that this would have been a whole lot more explosive than what we saw on TV because of Brett Favre's personality. But the personalities on that team beyond Brett Favre, Jared Allen, the Williams wall, Ray Edwards was a pretty eclectic character, Antoine Winfield, EJ Henderson, and that's just on defense. On the offensive side, Steve Hutchinson, Bryant McKinney, uh, of course, Adrian Peterson. A lot of veterans, a lot of great players on that team, both sides of the ball. Um, one of the great Vikings teams, honestly. Um, overshadowed by 98, certainly. But I think a better team than 2017. I think probably a better, a better team on both sides of the ball than 2000 when they made the NFC Championship game well-rounded don't know about well-coached um with Brad Childress and that'll pop up again maybe later in the show but that that was a Vikings team that really deserved to go the distance and of course you know how it ends the blowout win divisional round against Dallas that's the uh the rising action that's the the positive climax of the movie and then there's the letdown there's Bounty Gate the and, and its own documentary could be made about the 2009 NFC Championship game. Seesaw battle, up, down, leading, trailing, uh, lead changes, turnovers, special teams plays, heroic efforts followed by blunders, and officiating fiascos. Uh, the overtime alone. <laughs> That's another mini documentary with like five reviews, missed calls, incorrectly ruled uh, fumble, just... Wow. I mean, it, it that game was an absolute dynamo if you're a neutral fan and it took years off your life if you're a Saints or Vikings fan. Vikings on the wrong end of it, they lose. And that's how that season ended. One of the most entertaining Viking seasons in history, our third most uh, Netflix worthy Viking season. So we got two more before I get into the final two. Thanks for making Minnesota Sports rank them. Your first listen today, also check out Locked On Sports Today, the biggest stories around the sports world in 20 minutes or less, plus instant reactions, game recaps, and Locked On's take of the day. Locked On Sports Today, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Two to go, and we're going to go from 2009 to the team that was maybe even better, 1998. Yep, this is another one that takes on a similar trajectory to, to 2009 where it was good, good, good. Nothing stopping us now until it was over. Uh, and and even unlike 2009, there really was nothing slowing down this 1998 team. This would have been just a celebration of the greatest offense at the time in NFL history. And in fact, this season has been documented, I think, by NFL Films. And it's, it's one of the great... Uh, probably on VHS cassette. Uh, one of the great watches, really, uh, that you can can indulge in if you're a Vikings fan. But Randy Moss, that's a storyline in its own. Randy Moss, Chris Carter, Jake Reed, the dynamics in that receiver's room. How did Jake Reed handle being demoted to a wide receiver three after four consecutive 1,000-yard seasons? One of the uh, amazing, and not as if he did it on his own accord, but one of the great sacrificial moves of all time for Jake Reed to not really throw a fuss about that. I mean, Chris Carter's gone on record saying he was very accepting of that new role once he saw who Randy Moss was. Robert Smith, a, you know, all-time generationally great Vikings running back. Quarterback situation. Brad Johnson leading that team, getting hurt. And the journeyman, Randall Cunningham, coming in and resurrecting his career on a team that just managed to find... Uh, journeyman backups or journeyman veterans all the time in the 90s that seemed to be the Denny Green style uh he kept bringing them in they kept delivering Cunningham wasn't the first Cunningham wasn't the last but he was the best 
Uh, the way he threw the deep ball to Moss changed football. 1999 Rams became the copycat. Greatest show on turf. 98 is where it all began. Red McCombs, rest in peace. He just died this week at age 95. The guy that came in, people were nervous. People were nervous about Red McCombs. They thought that, crazy to think now, but at the time, Vikings weren't always selling out games. Vikings were in a stadium that wasn't as lucrative as other stadiums. People were worried Red McCombs was going to sell the team. And he comes in, he coins the phrase Purple Pride. Uh, he gets to oversee the most exciting Minnesota Vikings season ever. Uh, and he apparently never saw them lose until the NFC Championship game. I guess he didn't attend or watch the, the one loss that year in Tampa. Uh, they were perfect in the preseason, almost perfect in the regular season, one defeat, setting records offensively. Defense, John Randall. That's got to be a side a side story in the the uh, the show. What's John Randall like, you know, off the field, and uh, maybe when he's hanging around the house? That defense was full of big personalities. Ed McDaniel, Dwayne Rudd, Robert Griffith. That was a fun team. Uh, and then Gary Anderson, the perfect kicker. I'm sure that would have been a little side story in the documentary. The uh, the South African native who. Just didn't miss and had the one bar on his helmet and was such a an integral part of that regular season, only to see it collapse in the 1998 NFC championship game. Denny Green getting the Vikings to new heights after he had been on the brink for so much of his coaching tenure. One of the great Vikings coaching tenures, probably second to Bud Grant in Minnesota Vikings history, Denny Green uh, bringing players together. He was a galvanizer of players. Again, this is a feel-good season, folks. This is a feel-good season until it isn't. And they always end that way, right? They always end with the loss unless you're a Super Bowl champion. But the way this ended, in contrast to what that team deserved, uh, it gives you, and if you ever watch Missing Rings, it's an NFL Network documentary that, that visits some of the great seasons and in NFL history that did not result in Super Bowl rings. And Chris Carter talking about how he had been punched in the gut, how he didn't want to play football again after the end of that season. John Randall reflecting on it as well. Two guys that never won Super Bowl rings. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. That team knew it was special, and they thought they were destined for Miami only to lose a 13-point lead in the NFC Championship game. So of all the seasons that we've listed here, this is the only one that actually has kind of had its own documentaries. NFL Network, NFL Films have gone over this season because of its historic nature. But it's not number one on my list. What is number one? Can you guess? It's 2010. It's 2010, folks. What have we said? It's more fun to watch things unravel. And no Viking season in history has unraveled more than the 2010 campaign. I'm going to list off about seven zany events. And I'm probably forgetting some that happened this year. Number one, Brett Favre returns. Brett Favre has his arm twisted as Jared Allen, Ryan Longwell, fly down to Mississippi, drag his butt onto a plane and bring him back. I mean, that alone, the, the if the Favre entrance was heroic in 2009, kind of limping in in 2010. You didn't feel like he was coming in from a position of strength. And he might have been literally limping, for all we know, still off of that uh, the Bounty Gate game injuries where he really got banged up. Uh, so far returns. Season starts out terribly. They lose week one. They lose week two. Want to say they started out two and four. They had a thriller at Green Bay where Percy Harvin caught a touchdown with inside of a minute to go, it looked like another Minneapolis miracle, only to have review wipe the touchdown away, and the Vikings lost that game at Lambeau. Uh, Brett Favre repeatedly knocked out of football games. Was knocked out against New England. Sorry, took me a second there. Was knocked out against Buffalo. Was knocked out against Chicago. Three times he had to exit games with injuries. The guy's body was starting to break down. His streak of consecutive starts ended after he was knocked out in that Buffalo game. Uh, Brett Favre, gigantic storyline this season, but not the only storyline by a long shot. 
Randy Moss comes back home. I can't tell you the excitement level of that week in Minnesota sports. So not only was Randy Moss coming back, but the Minnesota Twins were playing their first year at Target Field. They had a big playoff series with the Yankees. They were supposed to take it the distance and get to the World Series that year. Um, And Randy Moss that same week returned home. Vikings fans, I mean, the Moss jerseys that were walking around, the excitement level was here. And the return on that excitement could not have been lower. Uh, Randy Moss, I think, caught one touchdown for the Vikings during a very short stretch. He played against the Jets on Monday night. He played against Arizona the following week. Didn't do much. Then they went to New England. And Randy Moss, after the game, does a press conference, really kissing up to Bill Belichick, saying he misses the Patriots organization, low-key ripping the Vikings organization, and Brad Childress cuts him without approval from ownership. Ownership livid. And the following week, the Vikings go lay an egg against Green Bay at the Metrodome, and Brad Childress gets fired on the heels of cutting Randy Moss. Cutting Randy Moss, a local legend. Um, You talk about shocking. The Moss cut, one of the most shocking in-season moves in Minnesota Vikings history, bar none. Um, So that's Moss. Oh, and by the way, he insulted a caterer during his time in Minnesota as well. I hope that was caught on tape. The Metrodome collapsed. It collapsed as we're having a, a massive snowstorm right now here. In the Twin Cities, the Metrodome collapsed that year. And it sent the Vikings to play in Detroit. The Vikings also had a game delayed from Sunday to Tuesday in Philadelphia because of a snowstorm. And because of the dome collapse, the Vikings played in a blizzardy, icy setting at TCF Bank Stadium on a frozen field. They played all these different days of the week, all these unorthodox venues, Brett Favre getting knocked out of games. Their stadium is in shambles. Their star receiver returns and gets cut. Their coach gets fired midseason. And the team obviously misses the playoffs. There was an injury saga with Sidney Rice. The defense wasn't nearly the same. It was all in all a miserable Minnesota Vikings fan experience and a crazy 2010 season, which, which I think is the most Netflix-worthy Vikings season of all time. Let me know what you think in the comments section. 2010, does it hold up? Is it the the craziest Viking season ever that you'd want to see behind the scenes? I think it is. 1998, not far behind. Uh, but let me know. Let me know your thoughts, your rankings. It's Minnesota Sports Rank. I'm the show that settles debates and starts new ones. I'm Sam Ekstrom. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next time on Locked On Sports Minnesota.